I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. 100 kanji. 100 kanji by the end of August. San ni ichi. Konnichiwa. Maku desu. And that's about it. <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is Mark. Welcome back to the Japanese language learning log. Uh, as you can see, I don't really know much. I'm embarrassed to speak. I have a hard time with production in general, as anyone might. Uh, I'm still very early in my Japanese journey, so if you're joining me for the first time, welcome. You can find the rest of the language learning logs up here. Today we're going to be talking about just that, why I think speaking is so important from a philosophical standpoint and I guess what I know about linguistics. I'm a student studying at NYU. I have two more linguistics classes before I graduate in December and I want to learn Japanese. I began at the start of June and my little pet hypothesis is that my knowledge of linguistics, even though it's quite basic, will be super helpful in learning a new language and will help speed up that process in a sense because it will make immersion a lot more meaningful because as an adult, I should be able to make more sense of what I hear and read. But yeah, I'm also very interested in philosophy and something that I wanted to pursue, which I didn't get the chance to unfortunately, was research into semantic uh, differences in our understanding of language. That's the kind of philosophy of language stuff that I'm interested in. So I do have a script for this video, but as I mentioned, like a third language log, I would love to make these more informal. So if my eyes are over here, that's simply because I'm reading. I don't want to do five takes for every time I try and say something. It is Saturday morning. I meant to record this yesterday, and as I'll talk about during my progress, the last three or four days have been kind of rough, which has influenced my lack of Japanese learning. At the moment, I think immersion is the best way to learn a language, and I think it's the most important thing you can do. Watch TV if you can travel to the country or somewhere that speaks the language natively, right? Watch TV, listen to podcasts, music, all that. Immersion is incredibly important because what we can take from kids, even though we don't have the same zip zap stuff going on in our heads, what we can take from kids is simply the amount of exposure they get. Being able to listen to a language constantly is the best way to simply get used to its sound. Our voices also just sound different than we think. I remember when I first started making videos, hearing myself back on editing was like, this is this is weird, and I'm sure many people can relate with that. There's an idea out there called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is effectively saying which language we know changes the way we think. For example, language word order in Japanese is fundamentally different. It's subject, object, verb, not subject, verb, object, uh, as I've spoken about many times before. I don't fully agree with this, but I have read enough papers on both sides to know that there's really no <laughs> proven or agreed upon concept. I think there is merit to learning how to think in another language on at least some superficial level. In other words, if a language doesn't change how we think, I think it's still important to be able to at least try and shift our thinking to adjust to a language. Language to me is a communicated expression of ideas. It's sharing what we internalize. I can take all the mumbo jumbo in my head and tell it to you. One might even say we've invented it to deceive each other. <laughs> but since languages are so different, expressing ourselves in our target language is a really important thing to learn. Human emotions might be the same all around, very basic level with expressions, but how ideas are communicated in language are different. For example, in French, referring to someone as tu or vous can have consequences. So if I refer to someone who I should respect a lot as tu, that's a very familiar term, like, oh, you're my friend, then, you know, that might come across as a negative thing. So if you don't understand these, these concepts on a very deep level, you might have a problem. In Japanese, one example that I read about in a book called uh, what is it called? Making Sense of Japanese by Jay Rubin. The difference between wa and ga for defining a topic or subject respectively uh, can have a big difference. There's a lot going on in that one little uh, grammatical term there. In Japanese, as I'm still learning, uh, there's a large reliance on context and what was previously said. With the verb at the end or negation coming after the verb, you can create a different kind of emphasis that you could in English. For example, in theatrics, it's not Mark killed the dog. It was, it's, you know, Mark the dog. And then you can kind of pause killed and you can kind of create different emphasis with this different word order. So there are things that you simply can't translate between languages, in my opinion, or at least to do so, you have to really stretch the bounds. And that's why we have translators, right? You need someone who not only can speak the language, um, and can turn it from one to the other. For example, we could just use Google Translate, it's gotten quite good, but we need someone who has a deep understanding of culture and history of both languages. Translators exist because they can bring the culture, experience, and understanding of these differences into the picture. For example, just think of how weird idioms are. Just the other day, I was calling with a friend and they said, um, are you made of sugar? And I was like, 
I've never heard that one before. And it's something common in Brazilian Portuguese, another idiom I haven't heard of. So these things that when you explain the meaning of, you're like, oh, okay, I can see why, you know, I'm in deep water means you're in a lot of trouble, but that meaning isn't really clear at first because if you're just learning a language, word by word, for example, then all you've got is the words. You need to have that understanding. And that comes over time with practice. All of this combined, immersion is incredibly important because, you know, when you're a kid, quite literally, you can make every sound as a baby. And as you work your way to your native language, you take all those sounds and then narrow them down to a specific subset called the sound inventory. And in my last learning log, the phonetics one, you can check that out. Got like 120 views right now. So thank you guys for the support on that one. This is just like a personal documentation thing. So it's really cool seeing people get into it and leave feedback. Feedback always welcome. What was I saying? Oh yeah, immersion something. Oh yeah, but as adults, Whoa. <laughs> now, as adults, it's kind of the reverse. There's something called culture-bound listening. When we hear sounds in other languages, for example, vent, vent, and vent, I probably got those wrong, but those are three different sounds in French. My point is only one of those sounds exists in English, so if you simply speak English, you will only hear the same thing over and over again, more or less. You might hear a subtle difference, but it's hard to make that distinction. So as adults, we need to you know, take time to learn these distinctions. And practicing speech is where that comes in. I have this next part in blue, I don't remember why, but I'm gonna read it word for word. So, as a result of all this, I think speaking in your target language is incredibly important. We can watch so much TV and slowly work our way through a lot of reading material, but that's teaching ourselves a language. In a way, we need to teach the language a little bit about us. We need to express ourselves in the language we are learning in order to embody it. I'll leave that there for you to digest because I think there's a lot there. One example is what I've been getting from simply writing in Japanese. As I write this script, I haven't written yet, as this idea came to me as I wrote it, so I'll say something about it here. Um, future Mark, take it away. I haven't written in Japanese yet, but what I can share is my experience of recording gameplay in French. I played the game Plague Tale Innocence, but what I found is that I need to speak French because it's one thing to translate in your head, but you don't want to have to keep doing that. I don't want to have to say, okay, I want a baguette. How do I say I want, je voudrais? You want to be able to learn how to speak just off the cuff in a way. You need to learn how you think. It's one thing to learn all of this stuff about Japanese, but if I don't start using Japanese in the way that I think, early, in my opinion, once more, then I'm gonna give myself a hard time later. We can see this in language learning apps. Even though you might use Duolingo every single day for two years, as soon as you try to create and construct sentences, assuming you were to wait this whole time, that aren't translated right in front of you, you're gonna have a really hard time producing speech. So I think the, the earlier you start this, the better. I can whine and whine about my weakest point being vocab, forever as I go on. As you'll see throughout the compilations in just a minute, I was feeling a little lost throughout the week of where to go next, and I'll touch upon more of that because I still kind of am. It's probably why Russian dipped off. I mean, just last night I was thinking to myself, no, I'm not quitting Japanese. Under no circumstances am I quitting this language. Because with Russian I did, and I, I just lacked so much direction for it. My goal is to read manga right now that I could use as my source for vocabulary, but my end goal is to communicate in Japanese, to have someone speak to me and for me to speak back to them. Like I said in the intro, my goal for communication is taking my ideas and expressing them. There's construction across the street, so I apologize if that's if that's made it through the denoiser. When I read something like manga or even this Japanese short story, while I've read the whole thing, it's still really hard because I have to sit down and you know look up what a particle might be. When I sit down to try and write ideas, I really don't know where to start. At the start of this video, it was simply, okay, how do I say hello? Konnichiwa. Uh, how do I say I am Mark? Well, from my understanding, I can either say Oriwa Maku, Watashi wa Maku, or Maku des. All three, I think, mean a very similar thing. You know, I am Mark. So that being said, before you feel totally comfortable, I would really recommend you start speaking and writing in your target language. If you're fortunate enough to know native speakers, speak with them. Uh, it might be embarrassing, sure, but it will be good for your learning. There are apps like Tandem out there. I'm not affiliated with anyone, by the way. These apps are made with this purpose in mind, and I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of international friends. So for Danish, I would ask my, I guess, two better Danish friends a lot of random Danish questions. Start producing language, find holes in it, and give yourself feedback. We can do so much on language learning apps, whether it be Heylingo, Lingapp, Duolingo, Rosetta Stone, but you might not need to know how to say the duck reads the newspaper. Hold on to the word read and perhaps newspaper, but you know, how can you say I read the book enthusiastically? So when you come back in the future, you can laugh at your past self. And I'll paraphrase Alan de Botain real quick, but if you're not looking at your past self and then laughing or feeling embarrassed about it, 
you're not learning enough. You're not moving forward enough. I mean, I already look back at my first language log where I said, I'm gonna read one story a week and I just, <laughs> no, not a chance because I've learned more and more that I don't know. That's it for our little philosophical riff of this video. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below, but without further ado, let's jump into my progress. Okay, so my progress. Uh, right after the clips, I'm gonna be talking about kanji, what I am going to be doing right after this, or for the next two weeks, I guess, because that's gonna be the end of the summer, and a little bit more about linguistics. So let's go ahead and do some progress clips. Cool transition. The past few days have gone by really quickly, it's weird. But anyway, um, yesterday I unexpectedly was not home for a while, but I'm gonna consider myself finished with the book. I finished the section I was working on, which was a flora and fauna thing. <laughs> My production is like almost there for the kana, Reading is pretty good. Still haven't finished making sense of Japanese. I've really been slacking. It's not okay. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll have a dedicated hour for this short story before I get to the flashcards. I was walking back. I don't know really why I thought this. I'm behind on all my goals, as always. I finished the writing book, but I'm reading the short story today. It's Friday. Still haven't finished making sense of Japanese. I am very close though. The, <laughs> the author rips on kanji for about a page. He brings up a good point. It's just funny. Um, but alas, it is an inevitable part of Japanese. I was thinking on the way back, because I got a notification of an app on my phone, why not just gear everything towards the N5 level of the JLPT? There are reasons not to do this. The encapsulating idea is because it's an exam to study for, and that's not why I'm learning Japanese. But if I've been unclear about my goals, I think it sets a good standard of sorts of vocab to learn and allows me to hit a certain benchmark. I want to, for the last learning log, have a conversation with a friend of mine but I can't put together phrases yet, even though I'm sort of, you know, starting to understand the basic layout of sentences. I think in the end of the month, I'm gonna get as far as I can for JLPT N5 and finish the particle section of Take Kim's Grammar Guide. That way, I have something more concrete to just like test myself with, if that makes any sense. Alrighty, so <laughs> I'm finally done with it. It's Saturday morning. Really didn't meet my goals at all. It's it's like a bunch of articles compiled and I definitely got like 20%, nah, I got like 10% out of this book of what it offers. So I'm definitely gonna hang on to it. Usually I try to get rid of books. You know, it makes you aware of some things and I'll try to keep an eye out for that, but it'll make a lot more sense when I think I, when I, when I think I know more about the language. I don't know, I, usually I, I'm trying not to record these like Mark speaks about the future, but I just want to make it clear that I'm really confused now. <laughs> I think vocab is like my next step. I've kind of primed myself, right? I went right to things with reading and writing and that's at a very good place. I would say I probably could have, I don't know. My progress is slow simply because I had the one goal, but just, I don't know. I feel like it's important that I show parts where I'm like, hmm, I don't know what's next. Next learning log, the one at the end of the month, I just decided this last night. I'm gonna make the whole video, you know, if I could go back three months ago, what would I tell myself? Uh, and right off the bat, one of those things is don't dilly dally. <laughs> um, Cause I could have gotten a lot more done in three months than I have. Uh, first month was good but then I really slowed down and it's disappointing. Um, so when I get to scheduling everything in this semester, I'll have more time than expected this semester, so some more intensive Japanese study sessions will be important. Two things. The first is I did some more, uh, I guess, hiragana, katakana, recall practice. Pretty much what I do is I go on Quizlet and Right now, I am very good at seeing the character and being like, okay, this is how it's pronounced. You know, I can pronounce it with no more than one or two seconds between me trying to remember the sound. But production is a whole different game, just in general. So you flip them so it shows you the sound, so like the letter O, for example, and I'm like, okay, that's, you know, whatever it is, but however the stroke order is. And so July 22nd, what I did was it gives me the sound and I try to remember, if I don't remember, I write a whole line of it pretty much, or a bunch of them at least. And so this was page one and a half of hiragana, and then pretty much an entire page and a quarter of katakana. And then I did katakana again the day after, skipping hiragana because I was better at it. And what's cool is that we have like a page and a half for each one, middle of July. Boom, today, hiragana, katakana. Half a page for each. At this point, it's down to some really tricky ones where the a lot of them have the core like shapes, I should say strokes. That's the cool thing about progress too. I was like, oh, you know what? I should just keep drilling this and get better at it. But then I was like, I'm actually pretty good at this. I'm probably past the point where I should have stopped doing this and simply let it be part of the learning from here on out. Because this reading these and writing these will be something I continue to do unavoidably as I learn more Japanese. 
it's just cool to see the progress going from like two pages of mistakes to half a page. That's that. Uh, and I realized I was really on the money with calling myself out on not knowing where to go. <laughs> I'm writing the script for this language learning log. So I hope you're enjoying so far. If you are, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> anyway, um, progress clip. I was writing this and I was like, I should embody what I preach. <laughs> this other benefit I'm about to mention didn't really occur to me for, you know, writing in your target language, but writing in Japanese and I don't know how to say something, I can look it up. If I don't know how to express a grammatical idea, I can look it up. And that's why I feel at a blank right now. Perhaps I would feel less so reading the grammar guide as consistently as I should be, but it pokes holes in your, in your own knowledge, but it's good because it kind of says, here's what I don't know. Here are the holes where I'm trying to express myself. I've just come across something that I think is amazing. I've only read one article and I was like, oh, very helpful. Um, it's japaneseprofessor.com. Quote, a lot of what I had learned in my early years of study only really made sense later on, especially as I began to study linguistics, end quote. Uh, quote, my primary goal is to help you reach this level of understanding more quickly by providing a guide to Japanese based on the linguistic principles that underlie Japanese grammar and conversation, end quote. It looks pretty thorough, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe you read this side of it. It's kind of funny how if I think back to my first learning log, I was like, I'm gonna read one of these short stories a day. <laughs> Just reading through the first story and I'm saying, oh, like, ooh, here's a particle, trying to pronounce things. Finding that I'm having trouble with like combining things, I guess. The English translation helps because I'll read the sentence, read the English translation, you know, okay, there's meaning there. And I'll try and match stuff, but it is a very slow process, but it's a good process. Uh, and I think something to note to myself is simply, as I go through these, I will get better and better. And as I, you know, as I practice reading, I'll get better at reading. As I learn and listen to more co uh, combinations of sounds, I'll get better at pronouncing everything. And then lastly, my understanding will grow as I learn more about grammar and again, immerse myself in more TV and books. All right, my eyes are low-key hurting because I'm straining them, but um, quick observation. I don't recognize words yet, so it's hard to know when to you know, stop one word and when to blend two things together or whatnot, you know, as you do in your native language. So something I think I'll start doing is listening to audio clips with um, accompanying text. Don't know if that will really help, but I think it'll be good to get in the habit of, you know, hearing the ups and downs because when you learn, or at least I think, this is what I'm gonna be testing in the coming month or so, as I learn the grammar, that's gonna be a little bit of the split. So what particle does this? How do I, you know, when does a word end? A lot of the indication of that is, you know, if something's in kanji, chances are that's the root of the word. So just waiting to hear the particle or something as I learn about them. Did I do it? The cool transition? I don't know. Um, probably should watch those back, but I'm not going to. All in all, I feel like I haven't gotten anywhere. But in reality, I think I have. I was talking about culture-bound listening earlier, and while I'm listening to music, I will look on Spotify, and you know, if the name's in katakana or has hiragana in it, I'll be like, hey, I know what those are. And so I can start hearing those sounds in the song, I still don't know what they mean. But with both songs and TV, mostly anime, been hearing more and more. I guess I've been understanding more. This is largely due to just the amount of listening to music, podcasts, and TV that I've been doing, but I also credit a lot to the grammar I've been reading. Reading 20 pages about the differences between wa and ga, I've started to hear various sentences with wa and ga. And so I'll pause, you know, think of the subtitles and think, okay, makes sense for there to be a, a you know, no wa here. When the subtitles say um, something with a subject, but then there's no subject when it's said, I can think, oh yeah, because Japanese does that. <laughs> they drop the subject sometime. That has been the biggest thing I've noticed and I'm trying to focus on the positive because I haven't really done any kanji except for a few really basic ones. Reading picture characters is really new to me. Very, very new to me. Uh, and something I realized is that as I'm reading this short story, I am sitting here and just botching it. Um, Ayako wa, and then there's two kanji here. So den shia. I don't know what den and I don't know what xia mean. I don't know what den xia means. There's a vocab thing in the back of the book, but this is my point. These two sounds are one word. The other two sounds are another word. Combined, they mean something totally, not totally different, but they, you know, both meanings combined with each other. In English, when I'm reading, I probably don't sound out every single word. I probably have come to recognize that the word beautiful is simply the word beautiful. I don't think b e a u t i f u l. Maybe if I'm spelling, but I don't think that and then think, oh yeah, insert meaning of beautiful here. It's just beautiful and then boom, I know what it is. So recognizing that in English and that's probably what I do when I 
listen and read has been super helpful in terms of approaching kanji from here on out. You know, I open up Anki and I'm like, Frank, this is difficult. Uh, I don't have an understanding, but I am like 60% there to feeling confident about, you know, learning new vocab. It's just a very different system and I'm trying to figure out how to tackle it on an intuitive level. Because as I produce these things, I might visualize the kanji and then think of the sounds and then say it. I'm ranting now. Um, I'm sure the progress clips were enough. So I think in the next two weeks, uh, 100 kanji is not totally out of the picture. Just basic kanji and stuff. I wanted to have a really basic conversation with a friend, which will be at best me stuttering and have some prepared lines, but I'm very uncomfortable with the idea. I wanted to push myself, but when I sat here thinking I should start the video in Japanese, I didn't come up with much. And I really I haven't internalized enough grammar. Oh, God, when I say grammar, I mean everything. <laughs> it's not just grammar. There's a there's a common pragmatic grammar view and there's grammar and syntax and morphology and all that. I don't know how much of the clips from Japanese professor I'm putting in, probably just a quick one of me finding it, but it's a really cool site because it, it takes the idea that I've been working with it. It explains Japanese in linguistic terms and I started understanding a lot. So ski, ski des, you know, like to be liking something, something is to be liked by me or you or whatever. As I start to internalize these things, I can then hear them in an immersion. So what are my goals? I didn't write any down. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it, 100 kanji. 100 kanji by the end of August. It's been set in stone. How am I gonna do that, you might ask? I'm gonna use Anki. I, you know, I think part of the problem is that I've given myself way too much choice in these things. Maybe part of it's just been like, I'm expecting to have an intro to kanji guide as well. I don't wanna get that big book on Amazon though. It doesn't look great, in my opinion. I think it is great, but not for me. But you know, the conversation I had with my friend was more or less what I needed. So I just need to practice more and internalize this understanding more. Finish like the first 200 pages of Tay Kim's grammar guide, because that's the key here. When I'm going through this, this short story, I'm just gonna open to a random one, um, and not understanding anything, I can pronounce it, sure. And that's definitely step one, if not step two as well. I can't prove my little pet theory if I don't study. And that's what's happening, I'm not studying. So this next two weeks will be a lot of memorization and a lot of reading grammar guide. That is it. I'll keep watching anime, listening to music and podcasts. I need to sit down and read the grammar. Because, now, lastly, I just wanna end it off saying, you know, this is all my opinion. I'm still testing this stuff. It's important that I verify that. But I do think there's a lot of merit to the idea that if we can go through a grammar guide and recognize that, oh, when there's ha after maybe a subject or I should say a noun, maybe, I don't know. It turns into wa and that indicates it's the top. When I see wa, when I see te, whatever, it's to me important that we internalize these things because then we know what to look for in immersion. And that's the advantage as adults that we have over kids that we should be making more use of. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any ideas for me or feedback or whatever, I'd love to hear in the comments below. At the end of August will be the last learning log. I'm not sure what it's gonna be about, but I will be continuing these monthly afterwards, maybe every other month, probably monthly. So, you know, definitely keep an eye out for those in the future, but it will be the last one. So maybe I'll do a special premiere and prepare it ahead of time. And in that one, I will brag to you about the hundred kanji I've learned, or I will just cry. <laughs> Cause it's like when you memorize kanji, you have to memorize the kanji, two sounds, the kanji itself, how it might combine with other kanji. You will get to hear my horrible accent as I read a page of one of the light novels or manga that I have. And I will show you the progress on my Kindle of how much of Tay Kim's grammar guide that I finished. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate the support on these. You know, it might be sparse, but it's still fun to make. With whatever you're learning, also don't forget to leave that in the comments down below. If you wanna ask questions, have a conversation, get some accountability, join the Discord. But yeah, without further ado, thanks so much for watching. Have a good one. And as always, don't forget to stay awesome. I'll see you in two weeks.